So causal inference, what is it? Well, it's something we're actually programmed for from the very beginning. We, we learn this certainly very quickly after birth, if not beforehand, we learn to watch the world around us um, and to start associating objects and actions with consequences. And so uh, we do this both <laughs> passively where we realize um, certain things maybe aren't um, as enjoyable as others, or you know, when one thing happens, then a horrible taste arrives in our mouth, um, or we, we learn them more actively um, by trial and error, by realizing when we touch things or we push things, we, we knock things off the table, then they fall, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that is um, one, of, um, one of the key things that, that, that humans do, one of the key things that many animals do. Um, and from that, we create in our head a sort of mental model of the way that the world works, um, you know, the, the, the rules that govern the universe, in a sense. Um, but this can become so sophisticated, and indeed it usually becomes so sophisticated, that we're also able, and perhaps we're unique uh, uh, amongst animals in this regard, to start asking questions about kind of hypotheticals or counterfactuals about what might have been or how could the world have been different. Um, and, and it's this ability, arguably, um, combined with our imagination that has allowed us, for better or worse, to change our world completely beyond recognition of our ancestors. You know, if you imagine our ancestors, our ancestors huddling around a fire in a cave and we told them what the world would be like now and we showed them what the world would be like now, it would be absolutely unbelievable to them. Um, but we have achieved this, I think, by this amazing ability to ask these questions about, you know, how could things have been different? So we have this tremendous brain, but it is also very easily fooled. Um, this, for example, is not a rather smartly dressed dog riding politely on the, the, uh, the, the underground to work in the morning. It is just what we first think it is when we see this, uh, you know, this owner probably leaning over and the dog's head sticking up because our brain um, has that mental model in place and it, 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 it naturally sort of over, um, over detects. Um, and similarly, you know, you could see puzzles like this one. This is one of my favorites um, because I still can't believe it. Uh, let's say that the square here, A and B, are actually the same shade of gray. Um, but there's obviously been a contextual confusion added to it that makes our brain really struggle to believe that. I had to actually swap the squares um, myself to really uh, become convinced <laughs> that they are um, the same shade and it's just my brain that's telling me they're not. And one of the things that we struggle with most of all, although it's absolutely central to our growth and development, is causal inference. Um, because probably for reasons of survival, um, we have become overtuned to making causal inferences. So we, our intuition tends to struggle to distinguish between a mere correlation um, and an actual kind of causal process. So this uh, duck um, on the right there, uh, next to these smashed gates, you know, there's a correlation there. The duck happens to be walking through those slash smash gates. It's not actually a super duck. But a small part of our brain might look at that. And the reason it's quite such a funny photo is that we look at that and go, wow, super duck. It's de destroyed those, um, absolutely destroyed those gates. And really the problem with our kind of causal inference machinery um, is that it's most well designed for what we might call a deterministic model of cause and effect and then falls down as soon as that's not the case. So what do I mean by a deterministic model? Well, this is one essentially where A plus B always equals C. So where um, this is a picture of a healthy woman from the Wellcome Trust Library. Um, if she was to um, contract Vibrio cholerae, um, then she would most likely develop cholera. It's a pretty deterministic process. So it's, it's one of those kind of causes and effects that we can we can understand quite well. But as soon as we, were, we, we, we wander into a world where that's not the case, then it becomes messy. So this, our brain, our mental model probably um, has an answer to what is likely to happen here. If we have a healthy woman who then smokes throughout her whole life, what is likely to happen to her? 
Well, we can't actually say with 100% certainty. Um, and there are certainly plenty of counter examples where the thing we might expect doesn't happen because the causal mechanism follows a more probabilistic um, process. And it's those things in particular that, that, that we uh, struggle with. Now, statistics and probability have really helped us with this problem because um, they allow us to describe what we can't know at an individual level. So we cannot know what will be um, the total number of dots when we roll two dice, um, but we can know what the likely distribution of these things will be if we roll them many, many, many times. So that's where statistics is so powerful. You know, we can't know this thing for the individual, but with statistics, we can describe the pattern that is likely to emerge when things happen um, in larger numbers. Now that's very, very powerful. And when we combine that with something else known as randomization, then we actually have an extremely potent tool to estimate these these causal effects that we otherwise couldn't get at with our with our intuition alone. So here, if we just we this is the kind of standard paradigm in in a lot of scientific fields. Um, if we select a whole number of individuals and then we randomize them to different situations, different um, interventions, or whatever, um, and they're effectively the groups that emerge were effectively similar at the time we assign. Um, the uh, intervention, so we can then make pretty valid comparisons between those groups in terms of, you know, this intervention is likely to have caused this effect. So that's a really, really powerful tool, those two things together. And it's so powerful um, that randomized control trials um, in health, especially, um, but also across many social sciences, have been absolutely embraced um, as the um, way to estimate a causal effect. And, and in, in uh, certainly in my field of kind of in health and medicine, it, it's almost canonized as, as a sort of um, the only form of evidence, really. They, they have this evidence pyramid where we say randomized controlled trials are the, the top and everything else is, is inferior and shouldn't be trusted. And maybe that's fair, um, because actually when we try and do causal inference in non-experimental or in observational data, then we have a very, very poor record because we don't have that randomization machine that we can rely on. Instead, we're just trying to look at patterns within data and work out um, you know, what associations might be causal. Uh, and we don't have a very good record at that. Um, the, this is a slightly provocative article, um, but it's illustrative nonetheless. They looked at 52 different claims from observational studies so not in uh, experimental data, and compared that to what was found in an equivalent experiment. Um, and they found that not only did none of them replicate, um, but actually five of these claims, they found the complete opposite um, uh, conclusion to, to what the, the observational data seemed to suggest. Um, so this is where we get this mantra that pretty much everybody knows. Correlation does not equal causation. Um, and it, it, it's such a, it's so, almost such a meme um, that, that, that we even have these um, amusing examples of where um, correlations occur that clearly are not causal. There's a website here, Spurious Correlations, um, which has things like per capita cheese consumption being correlated with the number of people who died becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Unlikely to be causal, I would say, unless, you know, cheese consumption and somehow means you're more likely to tangle yourself up when you're sleeping, but I think that's a spurious one. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's in a sense why it's amusing and why it attracts um, our attention. And it's because of this challenge that in general, we're sort of encouraged not to think about um, causality and not to use causal language when we actually conduct observational research. So this is one of the biggest um, journals in the field of medicine. And they basically say causal language should not, you know, should, should only be used for randomized controlled trials. It shouldn't be used when you're describing other um, uh, study designs or other analyses because, you know, it's not robust. Um, and certainly, again, in, in health and, and medicine, we have um, a tool um, which is used, I think it's called the grade tool to sort of automatically decide how um, how reliable a study is likely to be or how 
high quality it's likely to be. And if it's not a, an experiment, if it's an observational study, then it's algorithmically just described as low quality. You know, it doesn't matter how, how much effort you've done, it doesn't matter how beautifully designed it was, uh, the algorithm will just say, no, it's, it's low quality. Um, and it's perhaps for this reason that scientists uh, collectively, rather than talking about causal effects, which is what we're interested in, um, instead tend to use euphemisms. We tend to say there was an association or X was a predictor of Y or a risk factor, or there was a correlation or, you know, coffee consumption is linked uh, with um, uh, an increased chance of, of cardiovascular disease. But that's using different language doesn't really actually um, improve the science in any way. Arguably, it, it makes it worse because we've obfuscated the, the true intent behind what we're trying to do. Um, and more to the point, we are, regardless of what language we use, remember, we are programmed to infer causality. Um, this is a very accurate diagram of a typical scientist. No, of course, this is this is Pavlov's dogs, but it's there to say that we are not really that dissimilar to Pavlov's dog in that once we see things happening together, we tend to start to infer that there must be some mechanistic reason for that. It doesn't matter how many times we use, we say correlation is not causation. It doesn't matter how many times we try and avoid it by using different language underneath our brain is naturally doing that. But more to the point, is also spurious correlations have little if any practical value i see no scientific reason really why someone would go out and conduct a study just to say we found that these two things are spuriously correlated you know that wasn't that that doesn't seem to have much scientific benefit um so you know we end up in this sort of half-hearted situation where we tiptoe around what we're really trying to do um, and we say, oh, we shouldn't infer causality, but then we do it nonetheless. You know, we, we, we do this Pavlovian inference um, where we, we draw a causal inference um, nonetheless automatically. And, and my favorite extreme example of this is where um, we actually explicitly claim we don't make causal inferences and then make them anyway, which, which I've called Schrodinger's inference. You know, simultaneously, um, we say we caution against interpreting our estimates as causal effects. Um, this is an example from a, a, a highly cited nature paper a couple of years ago. And then later on in the paper, we have demonstrated that only a small part of the substantially increased risk of COVID-19 related death um, uh, among BA, ME groups and among people living in more deprived areas can be attributed to existing disease, et cetera, et cetera. That's a causal inference. Um, but uh, they also said we caution against making causal inferences. So this is a this is not ideal scientifically this is this we're being a bit sneaky here um and the trouble is when we do that also it does have real world implications because as much as we might say you know don't make causal inferences and even if we then don't make those inferences in, in our paper well why did we do why did we do the research at all and once it enters the real world naturally i can guarantee it will end up being in interpreted causally because of the reasons we've we, I described earlier. So this is an example of how that paper from uh, 2020 in, in Nature, which was looking at risk, uh, was looking at um, factors associated with COVID-19 related death, was then interpreted by the French government to determine who was and was not allowed um, access to certain furlough schemes, depending on whether they were judged severe. So in this paper, they say don't use it for causal inference, but once the paper's published, government started using it for causal inference and, and, and it had to be um, like, it, it had to be overthrown with an appeal to the high court. So that was, you know, a lot more effort than simply um, avoiding uh, uh, doing this in the first place in a sense. So what we could say is, look, observational research seems to be too dangerous seems to be very unreliable perhaps we should avoid doing it and just stick to, to experiments but the problem with doing that is that it would more or less exclude everything or at least the vast majority of interesting questions within the health and social science domain um, most physical chemical biological cultural economic environmental political behavioral and personal exposures 
Most questions related to all of these things would have to be excluded because they'd be impractical or they'd be unethical uh, or, or, or some combination of the two. Um, so that's not really an ideal um, solution. So the alternative, which is surprisingly radical because really it's obvious uh, from a scientific point of view, is that we actually turn around the traditional paradigm of um, avoiding causality and, 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 and pretending we can't do it and, and tiptoeing around it to actually from the very beginning accepting and admitting that this is the thing we want. We want, for example, to estimate a causal effect. We have no interest in, in, in spurious associations. We want to know how does X um, influence Y. Um, and once we do that, once we say up front, you know, that is our aim, I think um, it then starts to alter your thinking because the, the traditional method is to avoid talking about your aims too explicitly. Now, if we admit the C word, if we realize that these kind of scientific euphemisms are not helping us, uh, then perhaps um, uh, we'll, we'll do things more positively. And, and this from Anand, um, in 2018 has a nice description here. He says that the, the traditional, in a sense, pr prescription against the causality is, is harmful to science because causal inference is a core task of science. It doesn't matter whether we use randomized or non-randomized data. So without being able to be explicit about that goal and, be, and being explicit about wanting to estimate causal effects, um, then we, we, we get lost. Um, we end up without frank discussions about the necessary um, uh, methodology and approach that we need to use. And, and that brings us to the realization that if we are going to accept causality as our goal and estimating causal effects as our, as our scientific aim, then perhaps the problem hasn't been that it's impossible in observational data or very challenging, but that we've not been going about it very well, that we've, 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 we've missed an opportunity to actually take a more formal approach. And so the, 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 the logical conclusion is that we have to upgrade our tools, we have to upgrade our epistemology. And thankfully, there is um, a new framework, uh, or there are new frameworks available that actually help us do that, um, that bring in this great rich history from, from the, the sort of philosophy of causality through more recently to this domain of causal statistics um, into our applied research that we're, we're trying to do as causal data scientists or whatever you might call us. Um, so that brings me to sort of really um, highlighting what, what do I mean by causal inference and, and how does it fit in as a, as a goal? Um, to all of us as scientists who are listening. Well, what we hopefully agree on is that science is about building knowledge and understanding. Um, and therefore data science in its broadest sense, which would include any field where you're kind of using uh, quantitative data is likewise about gaining insights and extracting meaning from data. Um, but we think, and, and indeed uh, many others think, that it's most useful to think about data science as a sort of, um, as a wider set of activities that can be divided into three distinct tasks. And that each of those distinct tasks needs different methods and philosophies. And these are description, prediction, and causal inference. And in a sense, the reason we do this is to highlight that causal inference is distinct from maybe the more descriptive and predictive analytical approaches that we've tended to use in the past. So very, very briefly, just to, to orientate ourselves, what is description or, and or visualization? Well, this is a task that's focused on summarizing, describing and visualizing features of your data. And, and because of that, it's very much data driven. We tend to be calculating basic things like prevalence or um, incidence. And we tend to be, if we're using algorithms, we tend to be using what we might call unsupervised learning approaches, where we find clusters that we then describe or similar. Um, and this is designed to sort of ask questions like, well, what happened? Or who was affected? Or what was the occurrence of why um, in, in people who had X? So just to give a, a, a kind of relevant 
a more recent example, we might say, what is the risk of death from COVID-19 among bald men? That would be a descriptive statement where we would then say it's whatever it is, 1%, et cetera. Prediction takes this much further because prediction is, is sort of um, interested in, in using that data to, to make some kind of, uh, well, in a sense, predictions. You may also hear this known as classification or regression. And broadly speaking, it's focused on pattern recognition um, and forecasting. And again, it's a data-driven approach, but um, this time we tend to use much more sophisticated tools. So this is obviously um, the thing that has really taken off with the modern data revolution. Um, you'll be using uh, machine learning or statistical modeling approaches, supervised learning methods, et cetera. Um, and the aim is to sort of answer these types of questions. What will happen or who will be affected? Or um, are certain people more likely um, to have something than others? So here we might say, are bald men more likely to die from COVID-19 than men who have a full set of hair, for example. And then finally, we move on to causal inference, which is also sometimes known as counterfactual prediction. And the key thing here is that it is focused on understanding and that it is not data-driven or cannot be purely data-driven. We need a fusion instead of some external knowledge with all of the uh, analytical tools that we have available to us. Um, so these, um, it's, this is fundamentally different in that it's not something that we can get just by picking up a data set, doing some pulling a handle and then getting some causal um, estimates from it. We have to in some way fuse external knowledge, whether that's we know that we designed this as an experiment and therefore we have that external knowledge, or we know that it's a natural experiment, again we have that kind of external knowledge, or we know some other things about the data. Um, which I'll come on to in a second. So this is the aim that is really focused on questions like this. What will happen if, why are certain people affected? Or if we were to change something, how would it change something else? So the obvious question that you would then ask, given my previous um, examples is, you know, if a bald man was to buy a wig, would that reduce his risk of death from COVID-19? There's a causal question where we're trying to change that, um, uh, that association that we might have seen um, at a descriptive or predictive level. So what we have here then is the realization that no kind of data-driven machine learning approach is itself capable of doing causal inference. Because although data-driven algorithms are excellent at finding patterns, and therefore very good at predicting things like who's most likely to be affected or who's at higher risk, um, they, they can't estimate causal effects because of this. Causal inference requires that we identify and estimate counterfactuals. And those things are inherently not in the data. They can't be learned from the data. They're not just sat there because the counterfactual is something that hasn't happened. You have only seen the factual within your data, you have to provide some information to tell um, the, the, the process which things would represent good estimates of counterfactuals. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to provide some external knowledge or some control over the data generating process such that, um, uh, uh, such that we, we, we gain that um, perspective of how all the variables are related. So I tend to call this the story behind the data. How did the data come into being? What do these different variables mean? Um, and, and, and as I say, that's something that is inherently happening all the time when data, when data is forming, um, when the universe is playing out, when nature is, is playing out its role, but it's not something an algorithm sees. So the algorithm on the less, for example, which might be a, a typical um, supervised learning goal or a, a prediction algorithm doesn't really see any difference between all of these variables that explain the outcome why, whereas we know in the real world that actually they all happened at different times, influencing each other um, like the right-hand side. So how do we do this? How do we bring this external knowledge to bear? Well, thankfully, um, somebody has produced um, a, a, an approach or a series of approaches for us to do that. 
And the one that I'm going to really focus on today um, is, is what we some people would call sort of contemporary causal inference methods. Um, the most famous example of which is, is Judea Pearl's structural causal model framework. Okay, so what this does is it provides a formal mathematical and philosophical framework for us to actually explicitly think about estimating causal effects. And what it does is it combines different um, tools and reasoning that, that we had available to us before. So it combines probabilistic theory with counterfactual reasoning with graphical model theory. Um, and the, the, the absolute key to a causal inference approach um, is that we no longer, in a sense, just play around with um, data. <laughs> Um, somebody is kindly drawing on the screen there, <laughs> and I, I don't, I'm not actually uh, myself sure how to, to stop that, but, but never mind, uh, <laughs> um, I'll just go on. So um, how do we, uh, what is different about causal inference is this, um, this separation of our data analysis from a previous stage of formally identifying the thing we want to know, and we use our external theory to do that. And so this is known as, very helpfully, no doubt a statistician came up with these terms, the estimand, estimator estimate process, which I'll make a little bit simpler with the example of a cake. Um, so the estimand is the thing that we want to know or the cake that we want to bake. It's the end product we would like. Um, it is a theoretical thing that we work out beforehand and formally define. And that might sound rather trivial. Certainly, if you've come from a, a sort of experimental world, it, it, it tends to be quite trivial because it's obvious what the estimate would be from the way you design your experiment. But when you're working with observational data, actually, it surprisingly requires often a lot more thought than you think. But to give an example here, we want this cake or we want the true difference in Y due to some exposure X. Once we have defined that, it then tells us, according to the theory, the appropriate way to estimate that. In other words, the appropriate estimator or model that we would build or the, or the recipe list that we then have to follow. So once we know what we want to make, then we know which recipe we need to follow in order to make it. And once, so in other words, you've, you now know what you, you want, you know how you would go about and doing that, uh, you know how you would go about doing that, you then apply that to your data, and then you get your estimate. Um, and the beauty of this method, that although the estimate may be pretty poor, um, you, you, you're, you're sort of honest about the process from the beginning to the end. You've been very, very clear about what you wanted to estimate, to estimate, and therefore you've got a better sense that the thing at the end is what you want. You've not been fooled or misled by other quirky aspects of data analysis. And believe me, one of the big challenges with observational data analysis is actually that there are a lot of different pitfalls and traps that we can easily fall into if we don't follow this strict um, process. So what you may have also noticed within um, that kind of cake analogy is, is the use of the word estimate. estimate. Um, and I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about estimation because I think it is embedded within a causal inference approach as a philosophically distinct aim to what some of you may be more familiar with, that, which is the concept of testing, right? So in science, we often talk about testing something, but here I've been talking about estimating something. Um, and th this is the distinction really, that testing is our more traditional approach of trying to answer a binary question. And we've traditionally done this by sort of trying to say, is there a significant effect or not? We, we, again, we've generally done this by conducting these things known as null hypothesis significance tests, where we say, are these observed data, you know, consistent with a null distribution or not? The problem with that sort of binary approach, well, one of the many problems with that binary approach um, is that it encourages all these sort of bad practices like p-hacking, you know, uh, subgroup analyses that were never justified, altering who is, is and is not included in your study, doing some sort of additional adjustment, etc., all to try and answer a binary question. 
but instead to be more transparent, to be more um, honest and, and, and interpretable and hopefully more accurate, estimation instead focuses not on answering a binary question, but on just saying, let's try and come up with the best estimate that we can and the best estimate of the uncertainty around that. And so you build in explicitly the idea that no single study answers a question by itself. There's no such thing as a definitive study. That, by the way, is one of my least favorite terms. Because instead, you are simply providing your estimate that contributes to the collective knowledge. Now, of course, to many of you, that will sound less glamorous, because it is less glamorous. Um, but it is also far more suited to the scientific process as it should look. It places greater trust in the idea of us accumulating collective knowledge in order to make a decision. Um, and I think it also, if you, if you change your emphasis from proving or disproving, testing, for example, to simply doing our best to estimate this, then it actually encourages good practices, such as quantitative bias analysis, rather than these bad practices, which in the past have encouraged us, you know, to, to perhaps do some, some rather suspicious things. So I've told you, you know, that there's a sort of philosophy behind a causal inference approach. But, but how do we do this in practice? Well, the main tool that I use at least, um, and that people are using increasingly, are causal diagrams, and especially this thing, this family called the directed acyclic graphs. Because what they help us do is they help us um, identify that estimand, that thing that we want to know, by encoding our external theory of the data generating mechanism. This diagram down here has um, described a series of different assumptions that I've made about the way that A, B, C, D, E, and F are related. So a DAG, or a directed acyclic graph, is a non-parametric, that means we're not making any assumptions about how, you know, about the nature or the size or direction of these relationships, we're just saying there is some relationship, it's a non-parametric graphical representation of our hypothesized uh, beliefs about the causal relationships between a series of variables. These variables are represented by nodes, so you have these individual nodes, A to F here, um, and then the causal relationships that we hypothesize are represented by arcs, or arrows, <laughs> obviously just arrows. Um, and then the one rule is that you have no circular path, so something can't cause itself um, or cause something in the past, essentially, which is why it's um, directed um, acyclic rather than cyclic. So um, in terms of a, a DAG, um, they make a number of kind of statements or, or assumptions. Why is it directed? It's directed because causality is directed. It's something that happens over time. A cause can't occur after a consequence. So if we do something like this, we draw X arrow Y, then we're saying that Y has occurred after X. Um, so, you know, we are stating some kind of belief along this line. Changing X would modify the probability of Y. There's the probabilistic reasoning. Or if X had been different in these data, then Y would have been different. That would be a counterfactual statement. Or at the simplest of all senses, this is Judea Pearl's language, he says we could simply say that Y listens to X. When its, when its value is being formed, it listens to X um, in that information. Or we could say that if you wiggled X, then you would wiggle Y. So that's what you're really doing when you draw a DAG. You're making a statement um, along these lines that um, wiggling one thing would lead to wiggling others. So I'm just going to whiz you through some of the, the, the key language and concepts, um, and then we'll go in in the second half um, to understanding how this relates to the sort of real world a bit more. So this is a, a little bit um, dry, but these are, there's, there's actually not that much here. Once you've learned it, you know what DAGs are. So a DAG, a graph, um, contains paths, and the paths, a path exists between any two variables if they're connected by one or more arcs, and it doesn't matter what the direction is. So any two variables here that are connected by arcs have paths between them. So the path D to F to E, which I've highlighted in purple, doesn't matter that there's, they're not in the same direction. That's what we would call a path. Um, 
Now, the next thing you need to know is that paths in your DAG can be either open or closed, right? And when they're open, you end, then there will be a statistical association transmitted between those two nodes. So here, there's an open path between X and Y. That means there is some statistical association or correlation or dependency transmitted. When a path is closed, then no association is transmitted along that path. Right, now, types of path. We have, to begin with, a causal path or a directed path. It's obviously one where all the arrows run in the same direction. So a very, very simple causal path here, A to C, means that C listens to A, or if we were to wiggle A, it would wiggle C. But then we have other types of path, and this is the most important, um, or the first of the most <laughs> too important, the confounding path, also known as a backdoor path, is one where the arrows don't flow in the same direction. What you actually have is initial flowing backwards and then forwards. So we have this path, C, A, F. What's actually happened is it's going back from C to A and then forward to F. This type of path, a confounding path, will be open without conditioning. I'll explain what that means in a second. So when, um, so in, you know, in your, your uncontrolled data, we would expect this path to be open. Um, and therefore, although wiggling C would not have any impact on anything else, because there's no direct path, if we were to wiggle A, it would wiggle both C and F. And the point there is that variations in, in A would appear as co-variations in C and F. C and F would appear to go up and down together simply because A was causing them both. Okay? And according to the theory, therefore, if we were to stop that, if we were to clamp down on A and, 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 uh, or condition on it, control for it, adjust for it, I'll ex again, I'll, I'll formally define this in a second, then we prevent that variation from happening in our analytical um, data, and we would no longer see that covariation between C and F. So it's conditioning. Conditioning formally is the process of estimating a statistic, like a coefficient, at fixed levels of one or more variables. So in the last example, conditioning on C um, meant, would mean estimating at fixed levels of C, such that C does not vary. And we do this traditionally with a number of different methods. And I'm not going to go through these in too much detail, but we could, we could restrict. So we could say we're only looking at non-smokers, for example. That's where you estimate the effect just in a single value of that level, or we could stratify. That's where we estimate in different values or different strata. So we look at the effect only in non-smokers, then only in ex-smokers, then only in current smokers. Or most commonly these days, we do some kind of controlling statistical adjustment. So we estimate the effect of say, um, what was it in the last uh, picture? It was A, it was C on F, but we condition on C while uh, by including it as a covariate in a regression model. That would be a classic way of conditioning. And then there's other ways as well. Um, and by doing that, we close that backdoor path. We close, um, uh, we, we, we close that path and therefore we reduce the confounding. So this is an example of what I mean by confounding. So confounding is that you get a common association between two variables due to a previous common cause. So here, there is a well-known association between the amount of ice cream that's consumed and the risk of a shark attack. But that is explained by the fact that ice cream tends to be consumed on a hot day, and likewise, people go swimming on hot days, um, and sharks tend to come into shallower waters on, on hot days. So the weather is actually a common cause of ice cream and shark attack. It's a confounder. It would transmit an unconditional dependency, and therefore this apparent covariation is due to weather, right? However, if we were to condition on weather, in other words, if we were to clamp it so that we only look at um, single values within our analysis, say we simply said, let's look only at days where it was hot, then that variation would disappear and we would no longer see the co-variation that it causes between ice cream and shark attack. In other words, if we conditioned on the confounder, we would close that path that was previously open, we would stop the transmission of that 
unwanted spurious association and we would re remove um, the confounding. So that's, that's confounding. And then the final thing that I'm going to teach you about, which is actually the most head hurting, so it's a nice thing to just, you know, add on at the end as a, uh, before the first question session, is what is a collider and what is a collider path? Well, a collider path, unlike a confounding path, is one where the arrows, um, like a confounding path, sorry, is one where the arrows don't flow in the same direction. But this time it's because they initially flow forwards and then backwards. So rather than going back and then forward, this time we go forward and then back. So here's an example. A to C to D to F is all going forward. A, C, D, F. And then we go back to E. Um, unlike confounding, without conditioning, a collider path like this is closed. So there's no dependency transmitted between either side of the collider node, which is the one that the two arrowheads clash into. So that's F. So if we were to wiggle A, it would go all the way along to F and then stop. It would never pass over that, that collider um, and continue on the other side. However, if we were to condition on F, we open this path. Okay, so a collider path, unlike a confounding path which is closed by conditioning, a collider path is opened by conditioning. So here, this time, if we condition on F, if we only looked at people with one value of F or a reduced value of F or we included F in our regression model, then we would open the path A to C to D to F to E. Now these, in, these what are known as conditional dependencies are probably one of the most head hurting things in data analysis. And so it's quite useful to have an example. I gave you the example before of confounding. Now let's have an example of collider bias. Well, being, you, you know, the, the, <laughs> Uh, uncontroversial individual that I am, I'm going to go for the mediocre white male problem, mediocre white man problem. I'm going to say um, that in this thought experiment, privilege and talent are two competing reasons why someone might achieve career success, e.g. they might become uh, a professor uh, in epidemiology or something like this. Um, so in the general population, we could argue, we could argue about this, but in this thought experiment, we're going to say that talent, which is sort of something you're just given, and privilege, which again is something you're given at birth, you have no choice about that, are two sort of unrelated competing reasons why we might prove to be, um, why we might end up being successful in our career. But what happens when we condition on success? In other words, imagine we were to only look in people with a fixed value of that collider. So we were to only look at professors, let's say, in academia, right? Well, now we would expect to create an association between talent and privilege. And we would expect to create an inverse one so that there was actually a counter relationship between the level of talent you had and the level of privilege you had. The reason being that for the same level of success, you, if you have lots and lots of talent, you wouldn't need as much privilege and vice versa. If you have lots and lots of privilege, you wouldn't need as much talent in order to achieve the same success. So we would see this kind of classic problem where individuals with very high levels of privilege appear, who appear to have very low levels of talent, and then um, the reverse. Um, so this is an example by conditioning on that collider, we have opened this backdoor path and created this strange um, inverse association. So in the next part, after the questions, um, I'm gonna tell you how, or we're gonna learn how we use these things and this strange theory to actually inform our analysis and interpretation um, in, you know, in ordinary applied research. Um, but in the meantime, um, I think um, I'll just summarize and then we'll go to the Q&A. So as humans, we're naturally overtuned to making causal inferences, um, but that's, uh, and it's particularly bad when we end up with non-deterministic situations. The traditional theory-free approach that we have to the analysis of observational data, sadly, is not really much better than our intuition. <laughs> Arguably, it could be even worse. And as a result, we learn that correlation does not equal causation. And we're discouraged from using causal language and admitting our causal aims, but that clearly runs against the principles of open, transparent, and reproducible research. So to improve our research, at least I would argue, 
We should embrace our causal ambitions instead. We should recognize causal inference as a distinct task that requires distinct methods, and that those methods are about identifying and then sharing your theory of the data generating mechanism in order to define the S demand to, that you then go and estimate. And DAGs, I think, are a very transparent way because you can share them to identify your assumptions and then share those assumptions. Um, so there we go. I'm going to um, stop the sharing now and go over to Marcus, who hopefully has had a chance to look through some of your questions, isn't too overwhelmed. And we there, can are, start. there have been lots of questions and actually <clears throat> some quite good chat in the chat uh, answering yep. some of those questions. So for example, um, Dan Olner asked what the table two fallacy is, but that was explained by one response. And there was also a link to, uh, to a paper on that, which uh, hopefully addresses that question. And I also introduced that in the second half. <laughs> That's also true. Um, there were a few questions on um, your last couple of slides and in yep. particular um, collider bias. Lauren Murrell uh, asks, is conditioning a way of controlling? And there was, um, there was a partial answer to that in the, uh, in the chat. I don't know if you want to add anything to it. Yes. So it's any, when we say conditioning, it's a rather messy statistical term. The reason I always use that term rather than saying adjusting or controlling um, is because any form of conditioning, whatever method you use, that means in a sense that that variable doesn't have the complete range of its values, um, is conditioning. You know, so if you only looked at men, um, or if you only looked at people over the age of 40, or if you adjust for age in a model or something like this, all of these different methods all count as it, doing your analysis in some um, subpopulation of the full range of values. You know, some people would call it truncation as well. You've, you've truncated this um, in your analysis in some way. And so any one of those, whether, whether that's by design or whether that's by analysis, would then um, it counts as conditioning, would either count as something good if you're conditioning on a confounder or something potentially very bad if you're inadvertently conditioning on a collider. I hope that <laughs> answers that. Tough question. I mean, we, we do have quite a few questions and I'd quite like to get through as many of them as possible. Yep. Um, there were a couple of questions about uh, your last couple of slides, um, yep. which it might just be possible to clarify quickly. I don't know if you can share your slides again. So yeah, can I will, yeah. So, for example, um, uh, these were the ones right at, I think possibly that one. That this one, yeah, the, the mediocre one. white man problem. The one before that. Okay. Uh, this one or? No, before this the one. animation, sorry, yeah. So uh, the question was, why does it go back to e, um, to e from f if there is no arrow to e? That was from Isabel uh, Beholst. And okay, yeah. variable is the outcome in this DAG? Yes, okay, very good question. Uh, so I will explain why an outcome is a specific thing that we define, right? This DAG that I've drawn here, A, B, C, D, E, F, is just a DAG of several variables. There's no exposure, there's no intervention, there's no outcome. I would then apply that knowledge when before I conducted my data analysis. So I would realize that I've drawn this because I'm interested in, let's say, C and F. Um, but at the moment, this DAG is just describing a series of variables that are related and none of them are special in any way. Um, so that's so I will very much define that in the second half. And it's a very good question because it's absolutely critical, actually. Um, the second question is kind of why does E matter? Um, when there's nothing really causing E. Um, well, there are situations where you have these kind of weird variables that just cause something, but, but kind of occur themselves a bit randomly. Clearly, the most obvious example is in a randomized control experiment where you, you create a variable that has no history to it. Um, but otherwise, you can have kind of uh, measurement error or, or, or measurement approach, or you can have like which country these data have come from, etc where it doesn't really take part in any of the rest of the DAG but it still causes at least one variable and in this case E is still causing F so it might be which tool did we use to measure F if you see what I mean so depending on which tool you use F might be a bit different but that's unrelated to everything else so it's still an important cause of F um, but it's not uh, but it's sort of otherwise not a huge part of the network 
I don't know if that makes sense. We would actually call this, and I introduce this uh, again in the next half, a competing exposure. I hope that sort of answers that question. I'm going to go We've back to you. We've got a few you. related questions, so I'll just yep. go through them and then hopefully yep. you can give a sort of overarching response. So um, David Cahoon says, um, I still can't see that any amount of DAGs can allow for confounders that you haven't thought of. Um, well, you can never I allow for the thing you can't think of. Well, that is very true. <laughs> yes, exactly. But, um, you know, it's obviously true that if you can randomize, then obviously that is superior. Yeah, that's the only way of guaranteeing it. But you can, you can, and, and the, 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 the question is always, remember, we're trying to estimate things as accurately as possible. We are not saying we will, we will ever achieve perfection. And so the, it's turning that philosophy around slightly and realizing, you know, if we do this honestly, we draw a DAG, we put in all the things we think are important and we try and account for those, then we can kind of honestly hold it up and say, this is our best attempt. But other people can then point out and say, well, you haven't considered this or you haven't considered that. And in theory, we could actually then do some simulation to work out what impact that would have. So it's a philosophically different approach to sort of finding the perfect answer, uh, messier, but in a way that I quite like because it's, it's, it's more honest about science. And there were related questions along the lines of, uh, you know, how can you avoid the situation where everything is related to everything? Um, should the arrows be based on theory? How can you test the assumptions in your DAGs? Um, These are all beautiful questions that, that hopefully lead nicely into, into the next half. So it's, a, it's, it's really useful to see you're all thinking about these things. Yes, in the real world, in most social science and health situations, the DAG quickly becomes very complex. Um, and how we actually uh, deal with that, that complexity is one of the big challenges. It was always there, though, whether we used whatever method we were using to analyze our data. Um, in a sense, where the, one of the things that I like about this tool and this series of tools is it's prompting us to ask questions that we may have overlooked or not thought about with as much rigor as we should have in the past. Um, again, thinking of the, this being about improving reproducibility and transparency, um, I think uh, the beauty of it is that it, we're having these discussions in the open and we're sharing our assumptions in a way that we didn't do when we just sort of built a model and tweaked it on, on, under, the, under the hood. I think that also speaks to one of the questions, which is what do you do when you aren't sure what the DAG should look like which i think is just your best effort you know laying yes. out your assumptions and what you think you know as best you can yep. there is a good question on how you deal with um and i know this is sort of um not contentious exactly but an often asked question how do you deal with reverse causality or bi-directional causality if your arrows can only go in one direction yes well the truth is um the the true arrow doesn't only go can't go in two directions. It, but when you have a situation where it looks like variables are causing each other, uh, you know, and there's some bi-directionality. So, so let's say anxiety and, and um, sleep, you know, which comes first, the anxiety, your, today's anxiety or, or how badly you sleep. Because for me, you know, sleep makes me more, poor sleep makes me more anxious, but higher anxiety makes me less able to sleep. Um, well, what's actually going on there is, is there is a very close exchange between two variables over time. Um, and so any time where it seems like there's probably bidirectionality, what you've actually got is the two variables are causing each other at successive nodes over time. You know, so, so yesterday's anxiety affected my sleep last night, which affected my anxiety today, which affects my sleep tonight, and so on and so forth. So there's not, there is a direction. Um, but, and this is the scary bit, it means you would need a lot more intensive data collection in order to pick out the bit that was only going in one direction, if that makes sense. So one question from Mark Pilling, paths being closed or open is binary, but is it less binary than this in real analysis, <laughs> the only partial compensation for confounding due to... Bri absolutely brilliant question um, and absolutely spot on. The theory is, you know, we control for this and we close that path. The reality is it's an imperfect measurement of an abstract concept that we are trying to control for. And so instead we sort of reduce the effect of that, that backdoor path. A very good example might be, you know, people often say, and I was guilty of this a lot, oh, I've adjusted for socioeconomic background. You know, what I mean is I've got like 
one, I've divided them into poor and rich. Well, no, I haven't adjusted for socioeconomic background, not even close. Um, I've taken away a small amount of the variation in that, but there would still likely be a lot more variation contributing what we would call residual confounding. I think I'll define that again later, but a beautiful question, yes. And then again, it fits within the idea we can only ever estimate, you know, because everything we do will be imperfect in the real world. And it's related to David's question. You, you may not have thought of all of the confounders and even of the ones you have thought of, you haven't measured them perfectly. Yes. Which is the biggest, which is a, is a, you know, it's the biggest problem in practice is that uh, you're going to have lots of variables you have measured that may not be that important. And then others that you haven't measured or haven't measured very well that are important. And how do you kind of, uh, how, how do you maximize the information that you've got to produce the best estimate? And, and uh, you know, the gold standard, which we're not at at the moment, is that, you know, if you had a, a glaring confounder that you hadn't measured, that you could bring in external information and, and do a simulation to, to correct, you know, and see how, what would it be like if we had that, knowing what we know about this variable from elsewhere, um, but yes, it's 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 never going to be um, it's never going to be perfect. It's certainly a embracing the dirtiness but honest approach. I hope. So, a couple of maybe very quick questions to finish, and then we can move into the uh, into the next stage. One is um, how DAGs differ from structural equation modeling, which is why very good question. Um, I'll let you answer that. Uh, so an SEM is a parametric DAG, okay? So remember I said that a DAG was non-parametric, right? So when you draw it on a, on, on a, on a page, it'll, they'll look the same. But for formally, uh, a, a structural equation model, you have imposed a number of restrictions or assumptions about the nature of the relationships between those variables. You know, so you've said this is linear or this is additive or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, interactions is a good example. They can't really be included very easily within an SEM. Uh, a DAG doesn't tell you anything about all of those things. It's a much, it's sort of the thing you do first. So an SEM analyst, and, and I used to do this myself, I would draw the DAG by hand. That is a DAG. You then, you then do the SEM analysis and you get the numbers and so on, you've turned it into a path diagram or an SEM in a sense. It's one of the ways. But a lot of the thinking is, is there's some overlapping thinking between the two worlds. Um, but the one thing that I would flag up is that maybe traditional SEM was not so familiar with colliders and collider bias and the problem that that creates. And so I like it. I think it's very, very similar, but that's a big thing to go and learn about if it's not something you know. And I should probably... Um, move on to the second half, because a lot of the questions, hopefully, um, will, will, will now be answered. Last time, we learned one does not simply imply causation from correlation. It is not a simple task. We have, we have tools that we try and use um, to do this. Um, I introduced the DAG, um, and I also introduced this, which I think is, if anything, even more important which is the separation of doing your data analysis from first working out what it is you want to know. So from finding your, uh, from, uh, uh, finding your S demand first or identifying your S demand to use the formal language, you then build your estimator in order to estimate your causal effect. And you build uh, uh, and you do this using your external theory and knowledge of the data generating mechanism. And it's uncomfortable. That is. If you do not feel slightly uncomfortable with that, then you're, you're, then you're not actually grasping that this is an imperfect process. It is a, uh, a, a subjective process. But there is no alternative when we're not working with experiments. Subjectivity, the idea that we can do objective social science is actually um, a little bit ridiculous. Um, so in a sense, all we're doing is, is reminding everyone that we're working in, in what is quite a subjective field and that we need um, our subjectivity. So I, I told you last time that DAGs are a useful tool uh, to help us choose the appropriate estimator and then build our model, right? Um, for me, I also think they're most useful for identifying and avoiding certain errors and problems. Um, but the, one of the most important things is that they are absolutely not a substitute for thinking. 
you know, and the, the, the danger when I, when I teach this in anything less than the five day uh, a, a series that I sometimes give um, is that people go away thinking we've got a tool and we can just pull the handle on that. But, but really what, what I, what I like about DAGs is that it encourages us to think more and it encourages us to be more transparent and more honest and more open. And that's the main thing. Okay. So, so a DAG can't prove whether an effect is causal or not. And indeed we're never aiming to do that. What we're trying to do is the best effort we can to produce an accurate estimate. Okay. So uh, this attracted a lot of interest last time. Um, I was saying in general, what you'll end up doing is, is instead of saying something like the thing on the left, which maybe we used to say, we found a significant causal effect of X on Y. Of course, we wouldn't have used the language causal effect, but that's not what you're really aiming to say. You're aiming to say something more like the thing on the right. The estimated total causal effect of X on Y was this, right? So we're not saying necessarily that we've proven this is causal. We're just saying we've estimated it and this is our estimate. And you, know, you can take on board all the caveats that that um, contains. Um, so um, I, I, I'm going to, to um, return to some suggestions on um, how to actually go about drawing a DAG um, at the end, which is, is, is probably some of the most useful stuff. But at first I want to just um, pick up on how we go from our DAG to actually getting our estimand. Um, and that is, is, is actually surprisingly simple. And it, it, it was already alluded to by one of the questions. In order to estimate a total causal effect of um, something on something else, the first thing we have to do is define that causal relationship so we have to say, what's our exposure, C, and what's our outcome, F. And then we know that the, we want all the causal paths between those in our analysis to be open and all the confounding paths to be closed. So it is as simple as that. It would mean if we wanted the effect of C on F, then here we identify and condition on our confounding paths, A and B, um, and we leave the other ones um, alone. And uh, I've already alluded to this, but you know, these the the idea of a confounder and a collider and so on and so forth only um, exists once we have defined our causal relationship. So a DAG without um, defining any any the things that you're interested in is you know it's interesting, but it, it you can't then go on and describe what any of the other variables are actually doing. That only emerges when we say you know our exposure is C and our outcome is F, that is our focal relationship. Therefore, the other variables then take on these roles according to a series of very, very simple rules. A confounder is something that, mute, that causes both the exposure and the outcome. Okay, so it's a mutual cause. So in a temporal sense, it will occur before the exposure. A mediator is then something that channels part of the causal effect of the exposure and the outcome. So in a temporal sense, it is something that's going to happen after the exposure, which in turn causes the outcome. And then finally, we have these slightly unusual variables, competing exposures, which are arguably a lot less important from an accuracy point of view, um, because they, they only cause your outcome. They're a source of variation in your outcome, um, but they're not a source of bias. So we, uh, as I'll explain, we, we think about these in terms of improving the uh, precision of your model, but not in terms of reducing bias. And here we go. So a, a competing exposure is something that causes or is a proxy cause of our outcome. It doesn't cause the exposure and it's not caused by the exposure. It's coming from a different universe really as that exposure. So it tends to be things like, uh, uh, which device you use to measure the outcome or which country this is taking place in, you know, or, or some other cluster level variable, or often exactly that it's something that's occurring at another hierarchical level to the rest of your causal universe. So you might be analyzing individual level data, but, but the competing exposure is a uh, country level uh, variable. So it doesn't bias our relationship. So arguably you can ignore them, if you're, you know, you're focused strictly on estimation, 
but it does add heterogeneity, uncertainty to that outcome. So if you adjust for it, um, if you condition on it, then you, you end up with a more precise model of the relationship and, and therefore you improve the power. So from a sort of more traditional statistical view, it's still um, an important thing to consider, but they're quite rare. Okay, so the next thing uh, that I think it's important to distinguish between is unobserved confounders um, and residual confounding, or unobserved confounding and residual confounding. So an unobserved confounder, these are the ones um, that we would like to be able to condition on. We know they are potentially confounders, but for one reason you know, or another, we, we didn't measure it or it's not available for conditioning, or indeed we just didn't control for it, so it's uncontrolled. Um, and like in, uh, uh, there's lot, unlike SEM, there is no standard notation to DAGs, I'm afraid, and you'll find that DAGs look different wherever you go, um, but there is a sort of adopted practice that's very similar to SEM um, amongst many users, myself included, and so, I like to depict unobserved variables, what you might call latent variables, with circles or ellipses. And so here, because A is unobserved, we've, we've drawn it as a circle, and we can then see for our exposure outcome relationship, although we've conditioned on B, we have some unobserved confounding through A. Now, we might try and reduce the unobserved confounding from A with other information. Um, so we might have something that's very highly correlated with A, even though we haven't directly measured A, or A might cause, for example, our um, competing exposure, so that it becomes what we, uh, something like a proxy confounder. So here, E is not a confounder, but it it is part of it does um, it is related to A, so we could get um, we could close some of that um, path between A and F that, that represents confounding by conditioning on E. As we can see here, if we're conditioned on E, we would close the path e to, uh, A to E to F, and some of that confounding path via the unobserved confounder A would be closed. But of course, in the real world, it'll never be completely closed. I don't think there's any path probably you can ever completely close. Um, and so in this situation, there'd always be some residual confounding. And so I'm introducing this just to make sure people are clear of the different language, because often they get conflated between there being unobserved confounding, that is some extra confounding that you haven't been able to measure, and residual confounding, that is the leftover confounding, even after you've attempted to get rid of it. So my example in the Q&A, you know, I did a very basic adjustment for socioeconomic background, wouldn't have got rid of all of the confounding due to socioeconomic background, and we would end up with residual confounding. And so uh, doubling down on that point, there will always be some residual confounding after you've um, done your conditioning, because um, you know even if you have a very, very good measure of that confounder, it'll never be a perfect measure. Um, and that also assumes that the confounder is exactly the same thing that's causing the um, confounding. So again, take this, this nebulous concept of socioeconomic background, I might have a measure of income or a measure of education, but that's not necessarily socioeconomic position as a wider concept. So simply because I've adjusted or conditioned for one of these things doesn't mean I will have closed all of the variation that's due to that, that, that unobserved concept, if you see what I mean. So what I'm just trying to say there is, however well you do things, you will always have residual confounding, it's always there, so you're always going to be a bit biased, but we're hoping that by using this estimation approach, by being clear, by showing everything in your DAG and showing where you've missed bits, then it's a lot, lot better um, collectively as the evidence emerges than the traditional method where we might do these things a lot less transparently. So really, the irony of um, all of this fancy terminology and these, you know, all the excitement about directed acyclic graphs is that estimating a causal effect in terms of rules is very, very simple. For a relationship between an exposure and the outcome, all we know is that we, we should condition on confounders because that will block confounding paths. We shouldn't condition on mediators because that will block true causal paths and also potentially introduce collider bias, um, 
And optionally, depending on how much power we've got, we, we, we may choose to condition on competing exposures to improve our estimates, but we don't necessarily have to. But the main um, thing I just want to, to, to um, uh, again, really highlight here is that you, you gain your model um, from your DAG after you have defined the exposure outcome relationship that you are interested in. Okay, now you can do this with a series of approaches. You can either follow those, those basic rules or you can use software like daggerty.net and they'll tell you, you know, what is the, or what is a sufficient adjustment set of variables that you need to do to satisfy those conditions that says, these are the confounders, adjust for these, in other words. So if we were interested in this DAG on the total causal effect of X3 on Y, then we know from the basic rules x1 and x2 are confounders so we should adjust for those x5 is in a competing exposure so we, we we can adjust for those so a classic regression model that would address um the estimate that we're interested in would look something like this our outcome y with our exposure x3 and we've conditioned on the two confounders and the competing exposure so the model comes from the estimate which we obtain from the DAC. Now, we might have some unobserved confounding in there, so we might not actually know X1 in practice. And so, you know, ideally our DAG has flagged that up. We can discuss that in our discussion, or better still, as I've described, you could conduct some simulations, what's known as quantitative bias analysis, to try and say, well, what do we know about X1's relationship with X3 and Y? Based on that, you know, here's a better estimate we could produce. But more importantly, once we have our model, we have created that model in order to estimate a specific causal effect, right? We created this model um, from the fact we wanted to estimate the total causal effect of, S3, uh, of X3 on Y. We should not, therefore, interpret the coefficients for the other covariates in that model, right? Because those covariates are there specifically so that we get the best estimate of the causal effect on X3. They are not there describing causal relationships for X1, X2, and X5. So if we were naive, we might say, oh, hang on, I'm going to look at my model and interpret the coefficient for X1. Well, that would be a bad idea because, in fact, um, X, uh, the other variables that we've got in the model includes a mediator. It shouldn't be there if we're interested in the total causal effect of X1, okay? So from the DAG, from the relationship we want, we, we construct the model to interpret the relationship we're interested in, and we shouldn't go and interpret these other covariates because they are not, they don't come from a model that we would have constructed to estimate for those covariates, okay? So here, the coefficient on X1, whatever it represents, is certainly not going to be the total causal effect of X1 on Y. And unfortunately, the reason I'm really laboring this is because certainly in my discipline, epidemiology, um, there was a long tradition of building a single model, which we might call a prediction model of our outcome. And then in that single model, interpreting all the individual coefficients um, as if they are, you know, describing some kind of independent effect in some way. And somebody asked this in the break, but that is what we call the table two fallacy. Because in the traditional um, approach uh, uh, in epidemiology, you would introduce your data and describe it in table one. And then in table two, you have your model of all the different variables explaining the outcome. But that model was not constructed from from a specific estimate. It was just, let's just throw everything in together. So the coefficients on each of the terms within it do not have um, much, if any, meaning, and indeed often can be extremely misleading. So if we return to the example that I highlighted earlier on, where there was some Schrodinger's inference taking place, the bigger problem um, from this uh, Nature paper, Factors Associated with COVID-19 Related Death Using Open Safely, is that there was a massive table two fallacy taking place. What they had done is they had built a large model predicting the outcome, which was COVID-19 related death, from a whole series of different predictors, and then interpreted the 
um, coefficients on those predictors. Or they didn't necessarily interpret them that much, but they still present them for the world to interpret. Now, you may not notice this problem when you first glance, because often the coefficients look fairly believable, fairly plausible. So let's have a look at age. Um, yep, uh, this is for COVID-19 death. Younger people are at a lower risk, older people are at a higher risk. That makes sense. Uh, sex, men are at a higher risk. That makes sense. Obesity, as you get more and more obese, you're at more and more high risk. Well, actually, these all seem plausible, but they're still affected by table two fallacy. We just don't notice them that much in these situations. Where we then notice them is the situation where something very peculiar pops out, which means we're not really doing very good science because we're, we're, we're sort of not uh, questioning things when they fit with our pre-existing beliefs. But we then question when we see something like this, smoking. If you're a former smoker, it's bad. If you're a current smoker, it's good. Wait a minute, current smokers have a lower risk of COVID-19 related death. Well, some of you may have heard all the headlines that came out from not just this study, um, but several about maybe smoking actually is good for you in some way. But what's actually happening here is a very classic table two fallacy, which we can understand um, by using DAGs. And so this is where da an example of where DAGs are really, really helpful um, for us understanding and reviewing and appraising existing research. So um, here we have the relationship between smoking and death from COVID-19, but there's another variable, lung disease, which is a mediator for some of that effect. So smoking causes a higher risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which in turn increase your risk of death from COVID-19. If there are also unobserved common uh, causes of lung disease and the um, death from COVID-19, um, which I've just labeled you here, then lung disease becomes a collider for the causal effect of smoking and the causal effect of all of these other things you, right? So you here is all other causes of lung disease and death. So there's going to be loads and loads of those. If you look in the unadjusted data, you sort of see what you would expect in that um, smokers have a, 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 an increased risk of death from COVID-19. But in the conditional model, because they've adjusted for this collider, they've created a dependency between smoking and everything else, right? Now, we might interpret that as, you know, an independent association, but it isn't. It's now a joint effect of smoking and all the other reasons for lung disease and death from COVID-19. And so what it's really telling us, what this coefficient is really telling us in this model, is that smoking is not as bad in terms of your risk of death from COVID-19 as other things that also cause lung disease and death from COVID-19, which I bet is not how most people would interpret it. And of course, this is the big challenge with these models, is it's not only describing some weird complex relationship that's determined by all the other variables you have in your model, but it's also describing the relationship with all these other weird variables you don't have in your model. Because in fact, the supposed effect of smoking is now the joint effect of smoking at every other unadjusted reason, which I bet is not really what you are wanting. So that's an example of how we, we use DAGs to try and understand things that are going on, but also why we should be very, very cautious about the traditional kind of single model approach and instead really try and create a DAG to, to create an estimate, uh, to identify our estimate, to go and then estimate. The problem in practice, as has already been alluded to, is that it's very easy to draw a DAG with three or four variables in, but to draw a DAG with, you know, 20, 30, 50 variables in becomes very, very hard. And indeed, to draw a variable, uh, to draw a DAG in the real world, in applied research, is quite difficult. I would love at this stage to be able to point to a paper that I should have written <laughs> by now on sort of tips and advice on how to draw a DAG, um, but I, I can't, and there isn't one that, that I think is, is that useful as, a, as an early, uh, coming to this, as an early researcher. But what I have been involved in, um, in the last few years, um, is, is a review of, of how people use DAGs 
in applied health research so far. And then from that, we sort of try to come up with some recommendations to try and help people in the future. And um, so this is a, an evolving area. We're hoping that obviously um, we can uh, we can build on this. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's it, we're still all learning. You know, I mean, I think even the review, it taught us a lot about how not to draw DAGs, uh, which we then hope means we can do them a bit better um, in future. And to help you all, and this was actually a reviewer's recommendation, because I didn't want to make it too prescriptive, um, we have created uh, even a checklist, a bit like a, a strobe checklist, um, to say, you know, if you're doing this kind of research, uh, then these are the sorts of things you need to think about and report. So again, trying to be more transparent and more clear um, as the process goes on. So there isn't, um, <laughs> there isn't a huge amount of time left, uh, but I'm still going to try and whiz through uh, my sort of 10 uh, stage recommendation on, on how to develop uh, and present your DAG um, in applied research. And so hopefully by the end of all of these 10 stages, you too can share the expression of this, this very uh, uh, confident and, and, and satisfied looking chap on the, uh, the bottom right. Um, and uh, the first stage, um, well, hopefully this should be a, a stage that everyone is on board with, is to develop and state a clear research question. Um, and this, unfortunately, is all too easily um, overlooked and is therefore probably the thing that those of us who are involved in kind of helping people do research comes up most often. Uh, as this um, example from uh, Sarah Andre, who was taking part in a bit of a meme online, says, Hi, I'm an epidemiologist. You might know me from my greatest hits, including, what's your research question? Hang on, let me draw the DAG and please stop picking your potential confounders based on whether they're statistically significant. But that first stage of what is your research question is, is absolutely critical to get right if you're going to be doing uh, causal inference, uh, because it then feeds in to saying, what is your focal relationship? You know, what is the exposure that you're interested in? What is the outcome that you're interested in? And therefore, what is your estimate? You know, those things can't really happen if you have a very vague or unclear research question. There's an example from my own work. You know, I stated the total causal effect of fasting plasma glucose, that was my exposure, on risk of stillbirth, that was my outcome. So there you can see my estimate, total causal effect, of exposure on outcome. Now you've done that, you know what you want to do, you're going to start thinking about your DAG. The first thing to do is really get in your mind a sense of the context that you are analyzing from your data, okay? Because every DAG that you draw is, extreme, is trying to describe the data generating mechanism within the data set that you will ultimately analyze. It's not a theoretical description of every possibility in the universe. OK, it is very much focused on the exact data that you will end up using to answer this question. So that means getting a really good sense in your head of the population of the who, the where and the when, you know, again, from my own research, it's, it's I have to think about how are these are things operating in women attending maternity care in the north of England during this time period, you know, and that then really helps to inform me about how certain variables are operating. And I realized in the early stage of my DAG drawing, I often tended to think about counter examples in other countries in the world. Oh, but you know, in South Africa, this happens. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to describe the data generating mechanism in my context. And so I think that's a stage that we often forget about. And it's also bears a lot of implications for those who are trying to work in areas around sort of creating universal DAGs or consensus DAGs. The sad reality is we are trying to bring an understanding of our data and whether we can do that in a universal way, I'm not entirely sure, but it certainly is going to need some local contextual insight. The next thing I would recommend is that when you draw your DAG, you draw it as early as possible, okay, because um, for a number of reasons, you know, I've said they're important in identifying our assumptions. Um, and then in, in identifying as a result, which variables we ideally want to collect in order to condition on. So the ideal world is you actually drawing your DAG uh, 
before you collect the data. You're doing it as part of a study design process. Now, in the modern world, unfortunately, in a sense, most of the data we're getting these days is actually already collected. It's, it's you know, big data, it's routine data. So at the least, I would say, try and draw your DAG before you go and download the data and start conducting analyses, because it, it's, you are then free to think more theoretically about what's going on. Um, I, uh, I do have, uh, uh, there's uh, some argument about this, but I do think that it's okay to create one DAG at the beginning and then update it and update it depending on kind of expert feedback and sensitivity analyses. Um, but what obviously we don't want people to be doing is to be sort of redrawing their DAG post hoc in order to hide things that give them an inconvenient estimate. You know, if we pretend this isn't a confounder and remove it from our DAG, then we get the result we want. Well, that's not the kind of analysis we're hoping people are doing. So obviously you can imagine an ideal world where the protocol is, 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 is shared long before the work is done with at least an early DAG so that people can see that early thinking and we can understand any changes that have been made um, thereafter. So the next thing I'd say is when we're drawing a DAG, we're trying to use whatever knowledge we have available to us to describe the data generating mechanism within the data that we're going to analyze. So we want to bring the maximum amount of knowledge, expertise and theory to bear on that in order to most accurately reflect what's likely to be the reality. So my advice is that um, it should be a team effort. You know, you should be trying to recruit methodologists who understand DAGs and contextual experts who understand the context and then together, and ideally different types of contextual experts. And then even better still, you're sharing it with the wider world. I've seen people do this now where they say, here's my first DAG, please comment on it and tell me what you think I've got wrong. So that we're all collectively refining this um, and building in that expertise to get ideally closer and closer to um, the truth. Again, hopefully you can see how that fits with a much more open and transparent approach to doing um, data science. The next thing I want to say, and this is very, very important because it's often not done, is the DAG should include all relevant variables. Okay. So obviously um, it's not just your exposure and the outcome. That's, <laughs> that's not a very useful DAG, but it's also not just variables that happen to be measured that were easier to measure, you know, uh, that don't have so much missing data or so on. Ideally the DAG is the closest you can get to describing the universe that created these data. It doesn't have to be the same as what your final model is, but it's an, it's an honest description of, you know, in the ideal world, we would have all this information and we would account for all this information. So if you have variables that you know might be important, but you don't have them available in your specific data set, then include them. Show them as latent variables. I've done this, and at the least it says, here you go, people, this is the variable, or these are the variables that I think are causing unobserved confounding. Right, so you're absolutely honest about that and very clear about that. But ideally, as the next stage, you're not just highlighting it. As I've said before, you could even be conducting simulations to try and work out what effect that um, miss, those missing um, pieces of information are having. But at least just by including them in your DAG, people could immediately see and understand what variables are likely to be causing um, additional bias. And now, and this is really the hard bit, all of these stages are actually quite short, but the bit that requires all the thinking really is this, the drawing of your DAG. And when we draw, uh, in terms of recommendations, the first thing I would say is that it's far less important for the DAG to be pretty than it is for it to be informative. Okay, so this is an example where uh, a, a common practice where people try and draw them to sort of minimize the number of arcs that are overlapping each other or spread them out in a pretty way or something like that. Um, but actually, uh, the best way to draw a DAG um, is in the time order that you believe um, these variables are happening, right? Because a node is depicting an event, a specific moment in time whether that's the measurement of something that's taking place or indeed um, literally something uh, uh, that's happening. 
Um, and then the arcs are, in a sense, the sort of ongoing causal process between that moment and the next moment. So here, A and B, they, they happen, and then this, the causality is taking place, and then it emerges as C, and then more causality taking place, and they, you know, we emerge with D and E, and so on and so forth. Okay. The other benefit of this is that I think it makes it considerably easier both to draw um, and then to interpret. Um, and indeed, you can then simplify often, um, because what you're really thinking about is simply what is the order of occurrence between our variables, rather than really strictly having to start asking, hmm, could E cause A and B? Well, I don't even need to ask that question because E's occurred after A and B in my DAG, so I only really need to be thinking, what are the future variables that E could affect? Well, because E happens here, it's only really F, you know, maybe D, but in this case, obviously not. So that's what we recommend, um, and that um, process requires, you know, it does require a lot of thoughts. That is the bit that, that's hard, um, but that, that, you know, is what we, we recommend. Once you've done that, um, the traditional approach, which, which I've come across, because we're, we're sort of nervous about um, declaring causality, is that you only draw in arcs that make sense to you or that you're confident actually cause something. But arguably, you could do it the other way around. So you could say that simply because A and B occurred before C, D, E, and F, then my initial assumption would be that they are probably that, that they could cause C, D, E, and F, if that makes sense, right? So my null position is that if something be occurs before something else, it's a possible cause, right? And then, in, so instead of drawing in arcs, we recommend that you assume future arcs are there and then prune them back. Okay, and the reason for that is there's a number of reasons. Um, but uh, the main reason is that actually mathematically removing an arc is a much stronger assumption than including it. Because if you put an arc between two variables, you are saying there could be a causal relationship of any size, form, shape, etc. But if you exclude an arc between two variables, you are saying, I believe there is absolutely no causal relationship between these two variables. And so one of the reasons we make this recommendation is that in the past, looking through a lot of the DAGs that have been done, generally people have underspecified. They've been clearly missing arcs. You know, actually socioeconomic status, I think it does cause obesity, you know, it, it, it's, I, but they've missed an arc out there maybe because they're not certain. Um, but that might then have implications in terms of picking up um, the confounding set. So in general, it's better to sort of, if there's, unless you have good reason to say this variable definitely does not cause this one in the future, then we would say, think about including as a first instance. Right. You've basically done it now. You've drawn your DAG, you've, you've incorporated all of the expert advice. Um, but there is another thing that you could think about doing, which is, again, it's a novel idea. Um, and isn't really done that much at the moment, but, but I, I hope will be done more as time goes on, which is having drawn your DAG, there is some value in actually checking how much does your DAG agree with your data, or to be more accurate, how much does it disagree, because that's how it tends to do it. Um, so your DAG makes a number of implications that there should be a correlation here, or there shouldn't be a correlation once you've done conditioning here. And if it grossly misfits with your data, um, then perhaps you need to reconsider your DAG. Um, it's a controversial practice because those of us who have, have come from, say, an epidemiology background, the idea of testing um, and then following the data is, is not generally encouraged. Um, but I think there is an in-between where we created an initial DAG, and then we might create a second adapted DAG that has been, you know, refined based on, uh, on, uh, on testing it against the data. So here's a package that lets you do that, DAGRTR. Um, and you analyze according to both DAGs. So it's not that you just hide the original DAG and chase the data. You would still present them both, but you would also do some of this to sort of create a second DAG perhaps. Um, so that's something not many people do, but we would recommend. Um, and then next, um, and the, the most important stage, in a sense, once you've constructed your DAG, you use that DAG to inform and interpret 
the model. So this is what we were talking about before. Once you define your focal relationship, your DAG tells you which variables you need to adjust for, which ones you don't. And then that's how you then go and build your model. Now you might have multiple DAGs depending on your level of uncertainty or depending on whether you've gone the, done this data DAG sort of examination. And that's okay. People often used to have two, three different adjustment sets um, with different variables in them where they were uncertain about exactly what should be in there. Again, you're doing that, you're being honest about it. And, and you know, you, you, I think it's still useful to state which one you believe is most accurate. Um, but nonetheless, there's no problem with actually incorporating that um, in the process. Uh, and then so finally, uh, the thing I would personally like to see is that everybody's DAG is included in the publication. Um, you know, that it is, is, is as important, if not more important, than your table one with descriptive statistics, because, you know, this is telling us your assumptions, uh, uh, which are absolutely critical to your following analysis, but at the least make it available somehow, whether that's in supplementary material or some other way. I think every DAG should be celebrated. Of course, there are some that make some interesting assumptions, but at the end of the day, this is a new method. We're all learning from each other and um, it's, it, it's something we should be embracing and be proud of you know, whenever somebody shares their assumptions for comments and criticism. So my preference, whatever, however you do it, please share the DAG. It's, it's really a key benefit. So I'm just going to finish now by, by providing a sort of caveat, which is that DAGs are just a tool, okay? They don't help us prove causality. Arguably, we can never do that. We do inductive research. Proof doesn't come into it. Um, but it, it also can't indicate, is an effect harmful or is it protective? Is it meaningful? Is it trivial? It can't tell us about things like effect modification because these are parametric questions. You know, it can't tell us whether the cause is sufficient or necessary, uh, whether there's non-linearity, et cetera. Again, these are parametric questions. The accuracy of the estimate that you get will depend on the accuracy of your DAG. That might sound like a limitation, but I would argue those there are always you are always making assumptions in whatever analysis you do. It's just a question of making them explicit. Um, so, in summary, causal di uh, diagrams such as DAGs, which are the most common ones, are a helpful way to identify our assumptions and inform um, uh, our the appropriate analysis. They force us to make those assumptions explicit, and in that sense, I think they're enormous advance over maybe traditional methods, which often use kind of simple algorithms to, to select variables, or increasingly popular black box algorithms, which throw everything in, in, in a way that, that then is actually impossible um, to uh, interpret. I think one of the key benefits is that they encourage us, um, this whole process encourages us to admit and be honest about our causal aims and our causal ambitions, and then to state our estimates. And if we bring alongside that this principle of estimation rather than significance testing, I think it's a big step towards more reproducible and more replicable um, research. And the other aside, which is sort of generally my greater area of interest is also, I think DAGs are tremendously useful for helping us understand and avoid a number of common sort of challenges that occur in non-experimental data like um, the table two fallacy. So there's the main conclusion. Lisa um, has got that on her screen. Um, but DAGs are not a replacement for deep thinking and scholarship. They may be cool, um, but at the end of the day, the most important thing as a good scientist is that you are taking the time to think before you do. And I know we're under enormous pressure all the time to just get on with it and do the analysis and stop overthinking and all the rest of it. But if um, you rely on the tool at the expense of your thinking, that is when we tend to do things wrong. And so the main reason I like DAGs is they really force me to go back and think um, a lot more. I will share these slides, um, but these are the uh, some useful references if you want to read some more. And I think I will now stop for further questions. Marcus, are you there? And do you I have... am. I'm just looking through the questions again. We have lots of questions, so I'm trying to uh, think of the best way to go through these. So 
Um, again, I'm going to give you questions in batches because some of them are on a theme. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll start with two perhaps linked ones. Yep. One is how do you inform the relationships of all the nodes in the DAG theory, previous publications, stakeholder inputs? And you did touch on that, but you may want to say a little bit more about that. I think so it's very important. I think. It, yeah, and, and I think, you know, a, a sort of short answer is yes to all of those and perhaps yes. more. Um, but you may want to say a little bit more on that. But uh, I, it's an area of debate. Um, I would say uh, don't underestimate the value of theory. I think some, I'm a little concerned when people are relying too much on existing evidence, if you see what I mean, because there's a tendency to then be uh, overcautious, um, whereas actually the existing evidence may not describe your situation as well as you know it to be. You know, so it might be that alcohol doesn't generally cause this, you know, a certain outcome, but in your data it might. And so I think I'd say all of them are important, but yes, absolutely. Uh, not to underestimate the value of just bringing theory to bear and obviously stakeholder input is where you get that theory from really because they're the people who know what's going on. And then there are a few questions around time and going back to this point about um, bi-directional causality for example or causality that unfolds over time and some of the questions are how best to include that in the proposed framework um, and how could you represent what might the, the equivalent of a cross-lagged SEM in a DAG yep. framework? And then how do you test or va validate that the time order that you have is, is correct? Yeah, I, I would say that I, it is a, you know, you draw a cross-lagged DAG, you know, because they are effectively the same. You start with that assumption, this is what I think is going on. In terms of checking the direction is correct, uh, all you've got to work with, because again, you've only got your theory of what's going on, is your knowledge of when these things have, uh, were measured and when they're likely to be occurring, you know, and your knowledge of their temporal footprint. And unfortunately, um, it's not perfect. Um, what I would say is don't be fooled just by when it was measured, actually, because often we can say just when was it measured, but that can be very, very misleading. Uh, I give the example when I teach this more, more in more detail. You know, you could imagine me waking up in the morning and then someone saying, how long did you sleep? And me recording that down, it was eight hours. And then I go and stand on some scales and measure my weight. And you say, well, he measured his weight after he took his sleeping time. So weight must have occurred after he slept. But of course it didn't. Weight, weight was occurring for decades. You know, <laughs> um, it just happened to be measured at that point. So there's a lot of sort of clever little thinking you have to do. And those of you who do SEMs, you're going to know this. You know, I, 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 learned, I, I was introduced to SEMs before I was introduced to DAGs. And, and the thinking about what does a variable mean, when is it taking place, et cetera, was, was built into that thinking. So the beauty for you guys is, is you're already there. You're ahead of, uh, I think, other disciplines that don't have that, that history of, of, of thinking about some of these more complex bi-directional relationships. Clearly, when you end up with a very intense bi-directional relationship, it's not just cross-lagged anymore. It's like multiple days, lots and lots and lots of days, you end up with a sort of time serial DAG um, where your nodes will collapse into just today, yesterday, <laughs> tomorrow, rather than a specific day. Um, it's all possible. It can get messy in the same way as any SEM. And there's perhaps a, a related question, which is how you draw DAGs for multi-level analyses. So do you include level two as a competing exposure? A very, very, very good question and an unresolved one because, you know, the easy answer is to say, oh, it doesn't matter because, uh, you know, they're a parametric concern. It, it, how, how It's the causality you need to be getting at, but that's not an acceptable answer in the same way interactions are still things people want to know about. Um, I think I would certainly, for the level two stuff, I would, I would um, you know, it's more likely to behave as competing exposures and it's less likely to have the same onward effect on everything else you know they tend to come they do tend to operate almost as different universes what you might do you can play around is draw the upper level DAG and a line and the lower level DAG and just say here's where we think they interplay and otherwise you leave it at that but it's it's not resolved that's that's one of those um you know work in progress I, I think that's the same for SEM I don't think there's any kind of easy multi-level way of drawing these things yet and actually, you did touch on this. And again, it's it's that question of um, 
whether you're well it, it, it's an issue of um the problem being a parametric one effectively but uh, people have been asking about how you take interactions or effect yeah. modifiers into account when you draw a dag or do you need to switch to an sem model when you're doing that kind of thing well it, it's certainly a parametric question that you're asking once you ask is there an interaction taking place because in, in a sense from a causal point of view uh what you'll find is you're saying i believe this thing causes this you know and and, and obviously you're off let's say you've got x y and, and z uh, and you think that, that there's an interaction between x and y um, really you're just saying i think these two cause it but it's in a complex way um and so again you would just draw that in the same way there's there are attempts to try and incorporate interactions in DAGs, but I haven't seen anything I think is particularly useful yet. Um, what I would warn about is that, are you sure the interaction is what is, is necessarily picking up on a, on a real causal quantity or concept? Because how we analyze our data, how we chop up our data, which model and link function we use, etc., cetera, um, will depend on whether interactions and effect modification are visible or not. You know, often say, say if you do it in a binary way, you might see an interaction. If you then do it in a continuous way, you don't. Um, and likewise, if you, you, if you have a curvy linear relationship that you don't model very well, you might see an interaction. If you do model it, you might not. So they're, they're a little bit, you have to be more cautious with them. Uh, there's no formal way to incorporate them. I would still just draw the DAG and then say, we looked for them in this way, um, really. And there were a few questions about the smoking and COVID example. So I'll, I'll give you those questions and um, you can perhaps take them together. So one was whether or not, well, isn't adjusting for a mediator like lung disease removing an important pathway between smoking and COVID-19 deaths? Um, yes. And... So, so the first reason we would recommend against adjusting for a mediator is that you block part of the true causal effect. So you don't get the main thing that you want. The second warning, which I think is a more serious warning, is that it's like when you do adjust for mediators, and this is a problem in SEM2, is that it, those unobserved common re causes of that mediator, then you open up all these nasty backdoor paths and, and collider bias. And um, one of the questions perhaps comes back to why you need DAGs in the first place. In the example of the risk factors of COVID-19 deaths, what's the better approach to running a multivariable analysis where we're at risk of getting spurious estimates? Is it to simply run unadjusted analyses or something else? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, it's a difficult one to answer because I, I suppose I would come back to why are you doing this? Um, and that wasn't entirely clear in that particular paper to me. And I know I discussed it with others in, in great detail. If it was just descriptive, then perhaps it's just unadjusted analyses and you're just saying, here's some descriptive stuff um, but it, why are you running this descriptive analysis as well if you're not ultimately trying to sort of work out what's important and what isn't? Most of the time, I suspect you're trying, you are really interested in a causal effect. What it then means is that you might have a super DAG with everything in and all your different variables in. And then for each exposure outcome relationship, you use the DAG to select the appropriate adjustment set for that variable. And then that's what you then present in the table two equivalent. So we, we sometimes call this like a correct table two. So each line within, within that, each variable exposure outcome relationship has a different adjustment set, but it's giving you the total causal effect for each thing. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's right. I mean, it, it's the point is that each exposure needs to be treated on its own terms. It's treated appropriately. Yeah. Not, given its own model. <laughs> they all deserve their own model. <laughs> There's a good question here, which is, are there any empirical methods for evaluating an estimate? I mean, you've talked a lot about estimation as an approach as opposed to testing point nulls. Um, but this question, I think, is a sort of step further back in terms of causal inference. How do you get a handle on whether or not or how close to uh, the estimand, if you like, your estimate is? Oh, I wish there was an easy way to do this. I, I think, um, I don't think you can know that. I think uh, in the same way, you know, when you get a, an estimate and a 95% confidence interval from a single study, you actually have no idea um, really how close that is to the truth. It only emerges from repeated studies. It only emerges from replication. Um, and, and so it's a case of 
hopefully you've got other people who are also using good methods, also doing the same open, reproducible, transparent research, and collectively we're able to do that. Um, I think we need, I think it's a big cultural change to step back from sort of this idea of I've done a definitive study and I want it to be able to answer everything um, to just saying, you know, to this new way, but um, I really hope it's something we can embrace. And I would add probably this is where things like triangulation come in using yes. different approaches, instrumental variable analyses to see whether or not those different approaches give you. I'd strongly support that actually, because I think if you have different methods, each with different weaknesses, and then you triangulate on similar answers. It's very, very reassuring, isn't it?